So I'm going to start out. I'm going to start out tonight with some uh, with some passages. I want to read a passage to you from the book of Luke, actually, and and we're going to start talking about the history and mystery of wealth uh, because. There's really a lot in here. Now, there's a story about the unjust steward. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the first eight verses. I'm not going to finish reading it. There are too many lessons in here for me to teach tonight. It would probably take me five hours to teach you all the stuff that's in here. But I, there's one verse that I want to hone in on. So it says in uh, Luke chapter 16, it says, And when he, uh, and he also, uh, and he said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. Now, when it says there was a rich man and he had a steward, that steward was a manager. He was the guy who was managing the rich guy's stuff, right? And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, uh, for, thou no, uh, for thou mayest no longer be steward. Uh, then the steward said unto, uh, within himself, What shall I do for my Lord, lowercase l, that's my boss, so when I read the word Lord in this passage, it's not talking about Lord like Yeshua the Mashiach is the Lord or the Adonai Lord. It's talking about my boss, okay? It's a lowercase word Lord like the lords and the ladies, okay? So it says, he said, what shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me my stewardship. He, he took my job from me. And then he said, I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do that when I am put out of my stewardship, that they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors, of his boss's debtors, unto him and said unto them, uh, Unto the first, how much owest thou unto my Lord or my boss? And he said, An hundred measures of oil. He said unto him, Take thy bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. And he said unto another, how much owest thou? And he said, and a hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, take, that, take thy bill and write four score. Four, a score is 20, so four score would be 80. And then he said, um, he said, write four score. And then in verse 8 it says, and the Lord, by the way, that's lowercase l, his boss. This guy's boss. Here's what it says. And the Lord commended the unjust steward um, because that he had done wisely. Now why is this wisely? That's really interesting. Because that he had done wisely. And then it says this. And this is what this is the part I want to bring your attention to. It says, For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. What? And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. And then Jesus the Lord, capital L, says to his disciples, For the children of this world are wiser in their own generation than the children of light. Now, it means that the people who, what he's saying is, he's saying people who don't even know the principles of scripture are wiser. By the way, let me tell you what that word wise means. The word, the word, when we see the word wise in the Bible, when we see the word wise, you know, we have a tendency to think that wise means, wise means this is a guy or a girl, right? I know I'm not the best artist in the world, but it is what it is, right? We, we think of somebody with a high, what? IQ, right? So that we think that person's wise. We think the person has a high IQ, or we think they're smart, right? Or we think they're educated, so they've got a lot of degrees. Or we think they're intelligent, right? And we have in our minds, one of the, I think one of the biggest problems I think one of the biggest problems we have when people are reading the Bible is they know what the words say, but they don't know what the words mean because they don't look up the words. They don't do word studies, right? So if you don't know what the words mean, how can you know what the word means, right? So the word wise does not mean smart. Okay, I'm going to mark it out with a red X. It does not mean smart. It does not mean educated. It does not mean intelligence. It does not mean a high IQ. And by the way, this is important because a lot of you have been made to feel by the educational system like you're not smart. You know what I'm talking about. I, uh, you, you're made to feel like you're not smart because you didn't get good grades. You're made to feel like you're not smart because you didn't do well in school. You're made to feel like you're not smart because, because, because maybe you read slowly like I do. Or maybe you, you do math slowly like other people do. And, and they want you to believe that that means you're not smart, okay? Or 
but I'm going to tell you something. Wise doesn't mean any of those things. The word, the, the biblical word, wise, if it were to translate into our 2017 terminology, the word would not be any of these, but it would be the word skill. So when it says the children of this world are wiser in their own generation than the children of light, what it's actually saying is, it's saying that the children of this world are more skillful, they've got more skill in their own generation than the children of light. So if you think about skill, skill, the word skill, you, how do you demonstrate skill? Well, you demonstrate skill by doing something, right? You don't demonstrate skill by knowing something. And so I want you to understand this, that the word wisdom, the word wisdom is not, is not a noun. It is a verb, right? Or, or wisdom would be a noun, but the word wise would be a verb. So what does that mean? That means wisdom is an action word. Wisdom is not demonstrated by what you know. Wisdom is demonstrated by what you do. See, knowledge is the accumulation of truth. Understanding is the assimilation of truth. Knowledge is the understand not knowledge is the accumulation of truth. Understanding is the assimilation of truth, but wisdom is the application of truth. Foolishness is the absence of truth, or ignorance is the absence of truth. So so when we see the word wisdom, we know that, that the way people recognize your wisdom is not by listening to your words, but by watching your actions. You get to demonstrate your wisdom in the, in the, in the actions that you take, in the things that you do. So, it says that the children of this world are wiser in their own generation than the children of life. Now, um, the word generation there means, means it, it literally is translated to the term age, like like we like the information age or the industrial age or the the um, uh, technology age. Okay, so when it says they're ch wiser in their own generation, that means they're wiser in their own age than the children of light. In other words, the children of this world they live, they exercise their skill in the times that they are living in, and they're not attempting to make their living in the past. Now. And in the email that I sent out um, a little a little while ago, I said that that um, a lot of times what happens is um, people don't realize. It, or no, I said it's easier to make money now than it's ever been in human history. Now I know there are a lot of people who would contend with that statement, but it's easier to create wealth not only just make money. It's easier to create wealth now in 2017 than it's ever been in human history. Like, it, like, it's way easier for me to make a fortune than it was for my parents to make a fortune. It's way easier for me to make a fortune than today than it was for me to make a fortune in the 80s or in the 90s, right? So a lot of times people think, well, man, you know, I'm too late. I'm too old. It's too late for me. No, 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 no. There's never been a better time. And by the way, I'm going to show you why it feels so hard. I'm telling you it's easy, but how many of you would agree that it don't feel that easy, right? I mean, I mean, there, there are folks who are struggling to rub two nickels together in 2017. And, and, and by the way, I don't condemn those people, and I don't condescend over those people. I understand that. I used to be that guy, right? I used to be that guy, not, not in 2017, but there was a time in my life where it was hard for me to figure it out financially. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not fussing at those people who are struggling financially. The, the reason I'm even doing this video is to encourage you that it doesn't have to be that way, and to show you why it is that way. So if it feels hard to you right now to make money, if it feels difficult, if it feels really challenging, I'm going to show you why, and then I'm going to show you what you have to do to step into that arena of what I call easyology. Right? You can become an easyologist and um, practice the art of ease. Instead of being a hardaholic, being addicted to everything that's difficult. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Okay. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to break down to you what, I'm going to save for, for the last part of this video. By the way, for those of you who've been following me for any length of time, you know I don't do short Facebook lives because I don't feel, feel like you can, I'm not here to entertain you, right? I'm not here to entertain you. Um, I'm not here to make you feel good. I'm not here to get you all excited. I mean, if you get excited, that's great, but that's not why I'm here. I am here to teach you something that you didn't know before you came here, so you can do something different after I push done than you could do before you came to this, to this presentation. So that's why I'm here. Now, so, so when I talk about, when I talk about 
um, the history of mystery of wealth, the objective of me showing you where it started and where it's come to is for us to bring you into the, an awareness of what you have to do to make it easy for you to create wealth. So here we go. So we're going to go from the beginning of time to the mid-1700s, um, right? So from the beginning of time. So you have to understand that wealth, okay, because, because wealth is an energy. So but everything is energy. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. It just changes form. That's the, that's the first law of thermodynamics, right? You can take a piece of wood, you put it in the fireplace. So it goes from being the energy of wood to being the energy of fuel. And when the fire gets done using it, then the fire becomes hotter until there's no more fuel. And then the, what used to be fuel now becomes ash, right? So everything is just changing, constantly changing forms. Well, wealth is an energy, but it's a high energy. It's a it's wealth and I don't want to sound new age because I'm not, I'm not new age, but the principle is the same. Um, wealth is, wealth is, the res is a high energy result. I'll put it like that. It's a high energy result. So, so from, from, the, from, the middle of, from the beginning of time, from the Garden of Eden, when I say zero, this is, this is Garden of Eden, G-O-E, the Garden of Eden. From the Garden of Eden to the mid-1750s, the wealth of the world was in agriculture and the world was in an agricultural age and agriculture is based on land so in the agricultural age the people who own the land own the wealth the more land you own the wealthier you were which by the way is why when God brought the children of Israel into the promised land notice that promised land he gave them all a plot of land which they were to build a family business on and here's what he said about the land he said the land shall not be sold forever the land is mine saith the Lord so he was giving them perpetual wealth when he brought them into the promised land because land equal wealth the people who own the land own the wealth now um, the, there's so many things that just existing in the agricultural age so many things that it meant and determined. So when you were in the agricultural age, um, however you, whatever your status was when you were born, that's how you lived and that's how you died. So if you were born poor, you were poor your whole life. You didn't have like, there was like, like and by the way, I know some people on this who are watching this right now think, well, you know, I'm poor. No, 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 no. no we're, yeah, you got running water. And electricity and air conditioning and heat in the winter time and a car it may be an old hoopty but it's a car you ain't poor right you may be poor by American standards but by the standards of most people in the world like the majority of the people in the entire world right now today you ain't poor okay now so so you but if you were born poor you lived poor and you died poor and you were born into a poor family if you were born into a rich family you were rich and if you lived rich you died rich and, and by the way, do you understand that how the world operates causes people to believe things that are not necessarily true? Like, so, so basically, when back in the agricultural age, if a person was born poor, they believed that they didn't deserve any better lot in life, so they did nothing to try to create a better lot in life. The people who were born rich, they believed they deserved to be rich. Right? They believed in manifest destiny. Well, it, obviously, this is what God wanted for me because I was born rich. Right? So they believe that I deserve to be rich because I was born rich, and these people believe that I deserve to be poor because I was born poor, right? So, and but people who were born who were born poor, they stayed poor their whole life. Now, another interesting thing about the agricultural age, people started working at a very young age, and they worked until they died. There was no such thing. There was no such thing as retirement. Retirement is retirement is such a new concept, and everybody goes through life today. First of all, believing that it's their right. Like, I've got a right to retire. Well, maybe, you're, maybe you have a right to retire. Maybe you don't have a right to retire. I don't know. But the question that I think you should ask is not do I have a right to retire. The question that I think you should ask is do I, should I even have a desire to retire? Like, why are you doing something that you hate so much that you can't wait until you stop doing it so you can go do something else? Why don't you go do that something else? Or why don't you do something to create enough wealth so that you can have you can have seasons where you work on the stuff you love to work on and seasons where you play at the stuff you love to play at? Right? So 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 land equaled wealth, but also in the agricultural age, change 
happened slowly. In fact, if you saw any major change in your whole lifetime, it would be almost a miracle. Like, what, and why did change happen slow? Because when you live in the agricultural age, you have to wait for gestation. And I think I spelled that right. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't, I don't know. It might be J-E-S-T. I don't know if it's J-E-S-T or J-E-U-S-T, but gestation. You gotta wait for gestation. And, which means you have to wait for seed time to become harvest time. You know, if you're raising animals, if you're raising animals in the agricultural age, you have to wait for the animal to conceive, and then you gotta wait for that animal to give birth. And that took time. So, but, and, and, and let's say you had so many animals, if you wanted to grow that number of animals, it took time for those cattle, for those cows to have bait, to have calves, and then for you to grow your herd took time. Or for you, if you got, if you were a farmer and you planted crops in the ground, it took time for those harvest, for that harvest to grow. And every year you plant a little bit more seed and you grow a little bit bigger harvest and you go to the market and you sell that harvest and you get a little bit wealthier every year, but it took you a very long time for you to grow your wealth. If you have a little bit of wealth, it might take you two or three generations to grow that little bit of wealth into a lot of wealth. I, I hope this is making sense to you. You say, well, man, why are you talking to me about the agriculture age? Because it's very important to understand how the whole thing got started and to understand why we have so many beliefs. Do you understand that the idea that there's something wrong with getting rich quick the idea that there's something wrong with creating wealth rapidly, that idea was started during the agricultural age because change only happens slowly during the agricultural age. So if somebody in the agricultural age told you you could get rich quick, you knew they were lying. Why? Because everything took time. But watch what happened. What happened in the mid-1700s? Well, in the mid-1700s, we moved, and I'm going to just put 1750 to 1950, even though it was more like 1953 or 54. I'm just going to put 50 just to make it easy for us to like wrap our minds around, right? So from 1750, this is, by the way, this is a couple thousand years, right? Because this is, this is like, this is zero, this is like uh, 4,000 BC, right? And then this is, this is like 1750 AD, so that's a, that's a long time. This is like 4,000 years, right? So, um, or more than 4,000 actually. Anyway, so, so what happened, 4,000, almost 6,000 years. So that's almost 6,000 years. So what happened, the land equal wealth. The people owned the land equal wealth. But we went, we went from the agricultural age, from, from 1750 to 1950, we went into the industrial age. And by the way, the industrial age changed where wealth was created. What happened? In the industrial age, machines equaled wealth. And these machines, those machines could be uh, railroads, they could be gun manufacturers because they could be cotton gin manufacturers, they could be, they could be airplane manufacturers, automobile manufacturers. Manufacturing in industry was developed and created from 19 from 1750s from the mid 1750s to the mid 1950s and that in and that industrial age took it took people very, very uh, people in a very that wealthy in a much shorter period of time now here's what's interesting let's say um, you grew up your parents grew up in the, in, in the 1720s and all of a sudden you're born in the 1750s and and somebody sees you work you're working on the farm right you're working on the farm you're working on the farm you're getting the farm stuff done right and what happens what happens is some guy comes by in his, in, his, in his horse and buggy, sees how hard you work on the farm, he says, hey, you know what, I got a job for you. If you'll come work for me down at the factory, I'll pay you more than you're making on the farm. You won't have to work 12 hours a day, you only have to work 10, right? And then by the time we got to the early 1900s, that 10 hours a day turned into eight hours a day, five days a week. By the way, we think that's our right, right? Like eight hours a day, five days a week. Anything more than that, that's just, that's, uh, that's, un that's I remember it's, un, it's oh I can't believe you're being that unreasonable, right? But the fact is, this is like all this stuff that we think is just well, like down and dirty, necessary. All this stuff is new, right? So, so machines equal wealth, and the people who own the machines equal wealth. But the people who created wealth in this era became wealthy much, much faster. People like who? People like Rockefeller, right? People like Ford, people like Carnegie. 
right? These people became wealthy, mega wealthy, in a really short period of time. People own the machines, you own the wealth. Now, the industrial age created a bunch of beliefs. What, that, that, by the way, in the industrial age, they were true. But I'm telling you, if how many of you understand that if you are going through life believing all of the things of the agricultural age in the industrial age, you're going to get left behind. If you're still making wagon wheels and Henry Ford is making Model A's, you got problems. And see, these, these people, these people who said, no, nah, you know, I'm just going to keep on making horseshoes, but thanks, right? They got left behind. And by the way, there will always be people who will be stuck in the past and get left behind and not be able to create wealth because they have to be right about the way, this is the way it should be done. No, that's the way it used to be done. That doesn't mean that's the way it should be done. The way it should be done, well, is pretty much the way it's done, right? I mean, should I be, should I be broadcasting to thousands of people across the world right now from my office in Tampa, Florida? Should I be? I don't know. Maybe not in the industrial age, certainly not in the agricultural age, but hey, we're not in either one of those economic eras now, so I'm so cool with it, I don't want to fool with it. I hope y'all are picking up what I'm putting down. So, you got, you got the industrial age, right? Machines equal wealth. Now, here's something interesting about the industrial age. There are three things that got developed in the industrial age that we bought into as the way things are, and I'm telling you right now, they are not the way things are, they are the way things were. And here they are. Number one, in the agricultural age, I mean, in the industrial age, um, if you worked in a factory and you did a really good job, the boss might come to you and say, hey, you're doing such a good job running this machine. If you'll go to school at night and learn management, I'll give you a promotion and you won't have to run this machine anymore. You can run all the people who are running the machines. And in the agriculture, in the industrial age, this became true. Education, equals success. That was so true in the agriculture age. And I'm going to tell you something. There are a lot of old school philosophers, old school business teachers, and when I say old school, I mean they grew up in the industrial age when that was true. And they are attempting with everything they've got in them to make us believe this is still true. And I'm telling you right now, very few things can be farther from the truth. Now, I'm a business coach and I work with a lot of people. One of the things that I found out in working with people. The more degrees and the more education somebody has from formal institutions, the harder it is for them to learn how to create wealth because they cannot let go of the need to be right. And if you become right in 2017, right today is wrong tomorrow. So, education equals success. That's one thing that was true in the industrial age that is no longer true. Another thing that was true well, is that if you, there was such a thing as a good job, and that equaled retirement. Hey folks, that's yesterday's world. It doesn't, it doesn't work like this anymore. Now, if you, don't, if you think it does, I challenge you to try to find somebody that's been working for the same company for 30 years who hadn't got downsized. Like, go get a good job so you can retire in 40 years and the company will take care of you. I'm going to tell you something. The company may not even be around to take care of itself in 40 years. So if you think that the, that the answer to your financial future is getting a good job with a good company with benefits and a retirement and a pension, you're going to get stuck like Chuck in a pickup truck. And no offense to anybody named Chuck, right? So that's the second belief that we bought into that's no longer true. It's just not. It's just, it's just like, hey, hey, guess what? It just doesn't work like this anymore. The third thing is, if you wanted to be great at something, I don't, and, and when I say be great, I just mean be recognized as great. You had to get permission from the powers that be. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's say in the industrial age, you wanted to be a singer. And you want to be a famous singer, you want to do songs, and you wanted to build an audience, and you wanted to sell lots of albums. If you wanted to do that in the industrial age, you had to go to Detroit and convince Barry Gordy that you could sing good enough. Or you had to go to Columbia or Sony or one of those record labels that had the machines, that had the machines that could produce a vinyl record. A vinyl record. 
Like you say record to your kids these days, they're like, are you talking about my report card? Right? You had to go to somebody who had the machines to produce a vinyl record and get them to record it for you in their studio with their engineers so that you could become a singer. And then they produced it and they got most of the money, but you got the fame. If you wanted to write a book in the industrial age, you had to go to Simon and Schuster, you had to go to Princess Hall, or you had to go to Random House, you had to go to somebody who had the machines, who could print the books, and they had to think your writing was good enough. But now, all you gotta do is write a book and upload it to Amazon's Kindle platform and develop an audience and tell folks you got a book and they'll go buy it. So you say, man, what are you saying? I'm saying that people who are still tied to these old ideas are stuck and it feels really, really hard to them to make money. And the reason it feels hard is because they are existing and living in the present, but they're trying to earn their income in the past. And so here's what they do. They keep going back to school. They keep filling out job applications and going on interviews. They keep asking somebody for permission to dub them as an author or a coach or a speaker or a this or a that. And they want another certification. And they want somebody to they want somebody to tell them that they're good enough. Well, I'm here to tell you that was all good, well and good in the industrial age, but it just hey, 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 it just doesn't work like that anymore. Now I'm going to tell you the best way to make a fortune, and that is to serve your own generation after the will of God. That's the best way to do it. Here's what you do. You find out what the people who live around you now, what they need, and you serve them what they need and let them pay you for it. So you've got to serve your own. See, he's, here's, here's what Jesus said. The children of this world are wiser in their own generation than their children like. That means, that means they understand better how to operate in the era, in the age that they live in, than the children of light do. You know why? Because people, people who are connected to, to belief systems, whether it be through religion or something else, they are so bent on being right already, they cannot change. But I'm going to tell you something. See, the... the do you know in the, in the industrial age, the longer you are at your job, the more successful you are? In the economic era we live in now, the people who can learn new things the fastest and change lanes the fastest, those are going to be the people who are the most successful. So what happened in the 1950s? Well, we went to another economic age. So we're going to say from 1950, and I know it was 1953, 54, somewhere in there, to 1978. We, we changed economic eras again. What economic era did we go into from 1950 to 1978? Oh, by the way, I'm talking about all railroads, manufacturing, cars, planes, trains. All the great manufacturing that we experience today, that manufacturing, manufacturing development happened in that 200-year time period. But what happened down here? We went into a new age. We went into the distribution age. And that is, we started producing so many goods and services, we had to figure out a way to get those goods and services to people all over the world. So what did we do? We developed distribution outlets. And in the distribution age, franchising was developed, right? Discount stores, right? Um, chain stores. Network marketing was developed in the, in the distribution age. MLM was developed in the distribution age. What else, was, what else was developed in the distribution age? Uh, MLM uh, infomercials were developed in the distribution age. And guess what? All of these things were means of distributing products that somebody else was developing. And the people who made their fortunes, well, who made their fortunes in franchising? Ray Kroc did in, 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 um, in franchising. In, in discount stores, Sam Walton did. Uh, in chain stores, Sears and Roebuck did. In MLM, Rich DeVos and um, and Rich DeVos and the other guy—I don't remember his name. Infomercials. You get you got your your you've got your um, Kevin Harringtons and your your Kevin Trudeaus and all these people made all this money in the 1950s, 1970s. And by the way, can you still make money off of land? Well, of course you can. 
But that's not where the bulk of wealth is. Can you still make money in manufacturing? Well, of course you can. That's just not where the bulk of the wealth is. Can you still make money in distribution? Well, of course you can. It's just not where the bulk of the wealth is. Now, I don't know if you're noticing this or not. What are you noticing? What are you noticing about these economic eras? Somebody type it in while I'm writing. So what happened next? Well, we went from 1978. Something very important happened in 1978. Does anybody know what it was? From, and from 1978 to 1994, we went into another economic era. And I'm going to see, a, I'm going to see what people are typing in here. So, so, so we went into another economic era, um, 1978 um, to whatever I just said. 19, um, I'm, I, get, I get really excited, can y'all tell? Because this stuff makes a difference. I, I promise you, by the time I get down to the end, it's going to be like sirens going off into your brain. When you see what economic era we're living in right now, it's going to take your life to another level. So, um, where was I? Okay, I used to know how to use Facebook. Okay, there it is. So, I, wanna, I just want to see what people are saying. I would read it on there. I don't have my glasses on. Services, okay, that's close. Um, uh, no, not there. You're getting close. Information, not yet. Boom, okay, that's good. Um, so, does anybody know? Anybody know? Okay, uh, it, it doesn't look like anybody's got it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just tell you. Oh, somebody typed it in. Who was it? Somebody typed it in. Uh, I think it was Yolanda. Yes, it was Yolanda Clear. Okay, Yolanda, you got it. Prize goes for Yolanda. Okay, here we go. In 1978 to 1994, we went into the technology age. And you know why? Because the personal computer was created. Personal computer, 1978, personal computer, that thing exploded. Why? Because it was time. And in the technology age, now here's what, here's what happened. In the distribution age, outlets equaled wealth, right? Outlets, and I forgot to tell you that. Outlets equaled wealth. So in the distribution, in, in, the, in, the, in the agricultural age, land equal wealth. In the, in the, in the uh, industrial age, machines equal wealth. In the distribution age, outlets equal wealth. In the technology age, this is so cool, tech hyphen no hyphen how. Tech know how equaled wealth. And the people who knew how to create new technologies, those were the people on the wealth. And we saw kids in their 20s on the front page of Time Magazine and Business Week Magazine who were the billionaire babies, the Bill Gateses and the Steve Jobs and the Steve Wozniaks were on the front page of magazines as billionaires. Why? Because they made, they served their own generation. They made their living in the economic era in which they lived and they weren't trying to make a living in the past. I'm, I'm, by the way, the, all of this stuff I'm teaching you right now, I promise you it's going somewhere. And if you will follow what I, if you will follow my lead on this tonight, your life will never be the same. Okay? So tech know how equal wealth. And then in 1994, by the way, this is the first, um, the first economic era where you didn't really have to own something to own what? Like these people owned outlets, these people owned machines, these people owned land, these people just knew how to do something. And because they knew how to create something, their IP, their intellectual property equaled wealth, right? Their tech know how. Now. Uh, we 1994. What happened? We 1994, 1994 to 2003. We went into a new economic era. What was that? What was that economic era? That was the information age. And I'm not going to write this one down, but this is an era where you don't have to own something. Like who can own information? Who owns the fact that the sky is blue or the grass is green? Nobody. So now, wealth is moving out of ownership. Watch, watch what I'm saying now. Wealth is moving out of ownership into control. It's moving out of ownership. So you had to own some land. You had to own some machines. You had to own some outlets. You even had to own some intellectual property. But now, you, don't, you can't own information. So what do you do? The people who control the flow of information, those are the people who own the wealth. I'm talking about your Sergey Brins and your Steve uh, Sergey Brins and your Larry Larry Pages. The people who the people who owned search engines owned the wealth. They controlled how people what people were able to find on this new thing called the internet, right? And those were the people that owned the wealth. 
what did you notice about each one of these? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to break this down because i got to erase all of this stuff to move on to our next two economic eras. What are you noticing about these? I'm going to write one more before I, before I erase it. In the 2003 to 2008, we went into what I call the techno info, that's hyphen info, hyphen edutainment, edutainment age. We went into the techno info edutainment age. Techno info edutainment, is that even a word? Of course it's a word. Didn't you just hear me say it? <laughs> okay, techno info edutainment. What does that mean? That means people who knew how to use technology to create information that educated people in an entertaining way, those were the people who owned the, we the wealth. I'm talking about people like I'm talking about people like Spike Lee. I'm talking about people like Russell Simmons. I'm talking about people like Jeff Foxworthy. I'm talking about people who knew how to take some technology, take some technology, create some information that educated people in a brand new way while at the same time entertaining them. And techno info edutainers may create a lot of wealth. And it, what's really interesting to me, in 2003, right at the beginning of this economic era, that is when I started my training company, um, Myron Golden Enterprises, in 2003, where I started teaching people the stuff that I knew how to do. I started right at the beginning of that economic era, and making money was so easy it was like, this is insane. This is, am I really making this much money? Oh, my goodness. I remember, I remember when I was making 30000 a month, I thought I was making a lot of money. And I went to a seminar, and Robert Allen said, yeah, you're about to have a breakthrough where you're going to make, start making some real money. I'm like, wait a minute. I thought 30000 a month was real money. Okay, okay. And guess what? He was right. Right? So, so that's the techno info edutainment age. The techno info, te info edutainment age is the economic era where people who know, knew how to use technology to create information that educated people in, uh, educated people in an entertaining way. Those are people on the wealth. Now, what are you noticing about each one of these economic eras? I'm going to show you if you didn't pick it up, if you didn't notice it already. They keep getting shorter and shorter. We're talking about thousands of years. We're talking about a couple of hundred years. We're talking about less than two decades. We're talking about 1978 to 1994, just like this is 18 years. This right here, this is like what? 12 years. And then what happens? 1994, this is like 11 years. And then what happened? This is only five years. Every economic era gets shorter and shorter. Why? Because the faster information develops and the faster new technology develops, the faster the world moves. That's why it's easier to make money now, to create wealth now, than it's ever been in the history of the world, because everything, for the first time in human history, everything is available to everyone. If I want to sing, all I've got to do is turn on my cell phone and start singing. I'm living my life like it's golden, living my life like it's golden. And somebody hears me and says, oh, I like the way he sounds. And I say, great, send me a dollar, I'll send you the song. And they send me a dollar. And a million people see it. And a million people send me a dollar. And I just made a million dollars selling my song without having to go through Barry Gordy. You say, Myron, what's your point? My point is every economic era is getting shorter. That's why it feels so hard. It feels hard to create wealth because every economic era is a lot shorter than the previous economic era. And what that means, here, here's what you got to understand. What that means that means that when you are living in this economic era, because every economic era lasts for a shorter and shorter time period, you have less time to prepare for the next change than the last group of people had. I got less time to get ready than my parents had. My parents, my parents, you know, they were they were in the industrial age, right? They were in the industrial age. They had a couple hundred. They didn't have. My parents didn't have a couple hundred years. But my my mom was born in 1940. My dad was born in 19. 34 or 36, so 36 and 40, they were born in 36 and 40, so, no, they were born in 34 and, four, 34 and 40, my dad was born in 1934, my mom was born in 1940, so their whole life growing up, they grew up in one economic era. I was born in the middle of the distribution age, and guess what, by the time I was 18 years old, we were in a new economic era, and by the way, when I turned 18 years old, when the technology age hit and Bill Gates and Steve Jobs were on the front of these magazines, everybody wanted to go to school for computer programming. 
in the 1980s. But you know what? They were late. Bill Gates started programming computers in the 1960s. He already by the by the time the economic by the time the um, the technology age hit, Bill Gates already had he had already had 10 years of computer programming. And so he had been preparing in this age for this age. And the people who created wealth in this age were create, preparing in this age for that age. I've seen, I've seen, I, I was born in this age, grew, grew, born and grew up in this age, was a young adult in this age, I was middle age in that age, I'm still middle age in this age, no smart other comments either. Okay, so you say, Myron, what's your point? My point is, it's easier to create wealth now than it's ever been in human history because everything's available to everybody, and because of the economic era we live in now is the best economic era, which I haven't even gotten to yet. And it's a, it's, it's a very unique economic era, which makes me wonder kind of what's going on in the world. But anyway, that's a whole other conversation. But it's, we live in a very unique economic era in many, many ways. I'll show you why. This economic era lasted for five years. Now, by the way, you can make money in all of these. But the closer you get to where you are in the economic eras of the world, the more money you are going to make and the easier it's going to be for you to make money. I hope you are picking up what I'm putting down. Okay. So... What happens is now we went from the techno info edutainment age to our current economic age that started in 2008. So in 2008 to me no no, me no no, we're still there. From 2008 until I don't know when, we've moved into a new economic era. And that is what I call the partnership age. And that is people who understand the significance and know how to create strategic partnerships, they will become the wealthiest people on the planet today. Partnerships are wealth. You don't believe me partnerships are wealth? Go watch Shark Tank. Go watch The Profit. Go watch all of these reality shows on television where people are getting multi-billionaires and multi-millionaires to invest in their companies and become a partner. We live in the partnership age. And I'm going to tell you the thing that really launched the partnership age into the stratosphere. It's a little company, you may have heard of them, based out of uh, California. It's a little company, and this is not going to be the best rendition of it, but it's the best one I got. Right? What is that? Little company called Apple. Apple created something in 2008. By the way, let me say this before I even go there. Did you know? Did you know that in 1999, which is which is 9 years before 2008, that Apple was on the verge of bankruptcy? 9 years later, 9 years later they launched something that within 3 years would make them the largest market cap company in the world. They would have more cash than any company in the world. Their 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 company would be worth more than any company in the world because of something they launched in 2008. What did they launch in 2008? Does anybody know? I'm going to see if anybody knows. What did what did Apple launch in 2008? Don't say the iPhone because it wasn't the iPhone. What did they launch in 2008? And no, it wasn't the iPad either. That wasn't launched until 2010. What did the Apple launch in 2008, nope, wasn't the iPod. The iPod was launched in 2001, I think. Nope, it wasn't the iPod, it wasn't the iPhone. Okay, I'm gonna tell you what they launched. Apple launched in 2008, the App Store. And here's what Apple said in the App Store. Apple said, in essence, they said, you know, y'all remember how we shut down the music industry and took it over? Y'all remember how we shut down the, the movie industry and took it over? Y'all remember how we just took over? Every okay. He said, we're about to do that with computer software. And they created this thing called the App Store. And the App Store, here's what they said. They said, if you will create software for our devices, computers, iPhones, iPods, if you'll create software for our devices, we will pay you 70% and we'll only keep 30. When Apple said we'll pay you 70 and we'll keep 30, Apple became the largest market cap company in the world. Now here's what's interesting about that. Within two and a half years, within two and a half years of Apple launching this app concept, which is nothing more than a partnership program. 
They said instead of us going into the software business and creating software, and instead of us hiring software developers, we're just going to partner with people who are already software developers out there, and we're going to, we're going to allow them to sell their software to our database of people who have millions of people who have iPhones, and millions of people who have MacBook Pros, and millions of people who have MacBooks, and we're going to, we're going to let you, if you know how to comp create software, create an app, put it in our store, when you sell it, if you sell it for $3, we'll give you $2.99, we'll give you $2.10. If you sell it for thirty dollars, we'll give you twenty-one dollars. If you sell it for three hundred dollars, we'll sell. Apple, in two and a half years, Apple paid out two and a half billion dollars in partnership profits. In two and a half years, we live in the partnership era. You can be solopreneur if you want to. You can keep on trying to build businesses the old way if you want to. You can keep on trying to figure it out on your own so you can sing the song when you get there like Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. But I am telling you that businesses that are booming in 2000, think about one of the, what is the largest online retailer in the world? The second largest retailer in the world, soon to be the largest retailer in the world. It's a little company out in Washington State called what? Amazon. What is Amazon famous for? Amazon is famous for partnering with people. First of all, they started out partnering with people who would write books for their bookstore, and now they partner with people. They said, well, if you've got a product, if you sell markers, we'll let you put your markers on our shelf, we'll sell it, and we'll pay you. It's called partnerships. And I'm going to tell you something. Yes, you can go ahead and try to figure it out on your own. But I'm, and, you, and by the way, you might even already have it figured out. But if you try to do it by yourself, you're going to be stuck like Chuck in the pickup truck. Why? Because you're trying to make a living in the past. The interesting thing about the partnership era is the fact this is the first economic era since Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. This is the very first economic era since Adam and Eve. I don't know how long I've been going. I've been going for a long time. I've been going for almost an hour. Wow. This is the first economic era since Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden that has lasted for a longer period of time than the previous economic era. It's never happened in human history. We are, we are actually living in a historic economic age. And you can be a partner. I know what you're thinking. Byron, I don't know how to write a, create an app, and I don't know how to write a book. And I don't know how to create a song. And, okay, great. That is why, that is why I created a partnership platform. Now I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. I know this is what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You can believe it or not believe it. It doesn't really matter to me. That is why I created a partnership platform to so that because I've already built multi-million dollar businesses. I've already taught other people how to build multi-million dollar businesses. My top student right now does over a million dollars a month in revenue. And by the way, I'm not promising you you're going to make any amount of money at all. I don't even know you, but I am promising you this. You better find somebody on this planet who knows what they're doing to partner with. So I created a partnership platform called the VMC. It's called the V, it's called the VMC or the Virtual Millionaire Club. I'm just gonna write VMC. Now what does that even mean, Virtual Millionaire Club? It's, I know it's kind of corny, but I'm gonna ask you a question. At the rate you're saving money right now, at the rate you're saving money right now, how long is it gonna how long is it gonna take you? I get so excited I start writing stuff backwards. How long is it going to take you to save up one million dollars? At the rate you're saving, I'm not talking about what you're planning on doing next year. I'm not talking about, oh, we're going to max out our IRA next year. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about at the rate you are saving money right now. How long is it going to take you to save a million dollars? Well, let me break it down for you. If you're saving a hundred dollars a month, if you're saving a hundred dollars a month, it's going to take you 833 years. If you're saving a thousand dollars a month, Okay, it's going to take you 83.3 years. Well, guess what? In 83.3 years, I'll be 100 and, whew, I'll be 133. So, like, if, if, if I didn't already have it figured out, that wouldn't be a good plan for me. Okay, but maybe you're saving 10000 a month right now. Well, if you're saving 10000 a month, congratulations, it's only going to take you 8.3 years. You're saving 100,000 a month, it's only going to take you 8.3 months, right? Now, you say, Myron, what's your point? My point is, you're probably not going to save a million dollars in your lifetime. So why not, and by the way, and by the way, that's another 
Industrial age idea, right? Save your money. Save your money. You better figure out how to invest your money. And you better figure out how to get your money making money. And you got to better figure out how to get some systems making some money. Because the fact is, saving money, all you're doing is saving a depreciating asset. Because when you save money in a bank, the bank is paying you less interest than prime rate. I mean, I'm sorry, than inflation, which means your money is becoming worth less over time. And the longer you keep it in there, the less it's worth. So there's got to be a better way than saving money. So, and I'm not saying you shouldn't save money. I'm just saying you better have another plan, right? So, if you have a million dollars and you spend one dollar, are you? Well, if you have a million dollars, are you a millionaire? Yes. If you have a million dollars and you spend one dollar, are you still a millionaire? No. You're nine hundred ninety-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine there. So, if you have a million dollars, the objective would not be to spend it. The objective would be to what? To invest it. You want to invest it. If you could get six percent, that would give you sixty thousand dollars a year. Right? That would give you sixty thousand a year. If you take sixty thousand a year, you divide it by twelve months. That equals five thousand dollars a month. So if you had a million dollars saved up already, right now, and you could invest it at six percent, it would give you five thousand dollars a month. This is why we call this the Virtual Millionaire Club. Why? Because you're not going to save a million dollars in your lifetime. We, I mean, some of you may, but most of you, you're not going to save a million dollars in your lifetime. So you need another plan. But if you did save a million dollars and invested it at 6%, it would give you $5,000 a month. Pa passive cash flow. Now, I don't have any investments for you. The partnership program that I created is not an investment, okay? However, I realize that if investing a million dollars at 6% gives you a $5,000 a month passive lifestyle, and here's what the difference between $5,000 a month passive is. You're making $5,000 a month and you get back your 40 hours a week. You're making $5,000 a month, you get back your 60 hours a week. You make your $5,000 a month, plus you get back your overtime. You make your $5,000 a month, you can spend time with your family. You make your $5,000 a month, you can still take a vacation when you'd like to. You can still go on missions trips and do stuff with your church because you bought back your time, which is, by the way, what the Bible tells us to do anyway, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So anything that gives you $5,000 a month passive cash flow is worth a million dollars to you. It gives you the same lifestyle as a million dollars. So if you've got if you've got a hundred houses that make you now I won't say a hundred let's say uh, let's say you got fifty you own fifty houses that make you a hundred dollars a month positive cash flow that gives you a million dollar lifestyle but if you've got fifty houses you're pretty much leveraged aren't you well maybe you could do it a different way maybe you could uh, maybe you could have vending machines right because vending machines are a good business or maybe you could have ATM machines and you charge people three dollars. I don't know, but there's, what if you could create passive revenue? That's the objective. What if you could create some passive money, some money comes in that comes in without you going out to get it? That's what the Virtual Millionaire Club can do for you. Now, the Virtual Millionaire Club, I'm going to tell you what it is. It is not, it's not a multi-level. It's not even about the money you can make. I, I'm keeping it real. How many of you learned a lot on this webinar tonight that kind of blew your mind? Give me some hearts, some likes, some something. Give me some of those Facebook thingies, some of those emoji thing, which modules, right? You learn something tonight. It's going to take your life to another level, right? So if you learn something tonight that you believe is going to take your life to another level, the Virtual Millionaire Club is an educational platform where I spend, I spend my time, I spend my time teaching you the things that I've learned. I've invested the last several decades of my life learning how to create wealth. And the Virtual Millionaire Club is a, is a membership area, it's a membership website where I teach you the things that I've learned. You get two audios a week, two audios per week. You get one video per month. And I know, I know I could charge up $97 a month for this. I could have charged you $97 for what I taught you tonight and you'd be glad that you paid it, that you didn't miss this information. But we don't charge $97 a month. I could charge $197 a month. By the way, I know there are people out there who would pay $197 a month to learn the kind of stuff I'm teaching you. But I don't charge $197 a month. Why? Because I wanted to create a partnership program where if there's a college student working at Panera Bread on the weekends, they could participate, learn how to create wealth while they're going to school and still refer some of their friends and still make some money. So here's how much the Virtual Millionaire Club costs. It's a whole $27 and 99 cents a month. 
Now, I'm talking about I'm talking about 92 cents, 92 cents a day. I'm talking about 92 cents a day to learn how to create wealth. What what are these audios about? What are these videos about? I teach three things in the Virtual Millionaire Club. I teach three things. You're going to get and and it's very similar to what I taught tonight. You are going to learn financial intelligence. You're going to learn business development. And you're going to learn it from a biblical perspective. That's what the Virtual Millionaire Club is. If there were no opportunity to earn money, the Virtual Millionaire Club, the information that you get is worth the $27.99. If you don't believe me, when you go to the site tonight, look at what all those people who are inside the Virtual Millionaire Club are saying about the content that they are learning in the VMC. Like, if there were no earning opportunity, if you did not have the opportunity to earn $0.16 cents off of this Virtual Millionaire Club, it would be worth it. Now, but you do. For 92 cents a day, not only do you get access to one vi two video, two audios a week, one video per month, plus extra Facebook Live like the one I'm doing like right now, but it pays out, not 70 cent, not 70%, but it pays out 72% affiliate commission. That means for every membership that you sell, you make $20 a month. For every membership you sell, you make $20 a month. Now, $27.99. You make $20 a month. That's $7.99 left over. The merchant account makes $0.84. Cent. You make $20 a month. Me, I make, are you ready for this? A big old whopping $7. I wrote, put the decimal point in the wrong place. I make $7. You say, you may be wondering, Marin. Why in the world would you give away the majority of the money for the work that you do? It's simple. Because we live in the partnership era. I believe this is the perfect economic era because it goes back all the way to the Garden of Eden and it answers a statement that God said. See, in, in Genesis chapter 1, God made seven, after God made seven things, he said, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is good. The first time God said something wasn't good, it is not good. He said it is not good for man to be alone. Yes, I understand that's talking about it's not good for a man to be alone. He should have a wife and be married and all that. I get that. But I believe it's bigger than that. It's not good for humans to be alone. Why? Because if we're alone, we don't have anybody to serve. If we don't have anybody to serve, we can't be great. If we don't have anybody to serve, we can't feel fulfilled. If we don't have anybody to serve, we can't be happy. So... I'm okay giving away 70% and only keeping 28% for the work that I do because I know it will set a bunch of people free. And so when I'm traveling around the world playing the best golf courses in the world, when I'm going on mission trips and changing people's lives, I don't have to do that by myself anymore. That's why we pay out 72%. Another reason we pay out 72%, 72 is one of the most important numbers in your life and you don't even know it. Do you know you learn how to do algebra, you learn how to do calculus, you learn how to do trigonometry. You know what you didn't learn in, in high school? You didn't learn the rule of 72. The rule of 72 is how compound interest is calculated. And the rule of 72 helps you determine how long it takes for money to double if you're investing, or how long it takes for debt to double if you're borrowing. That's why the average person doesn't know that when you pay off your mortgage in 30 years, you ended up paying three to five times more for your house than the price of your house because of the rule of 72. But you didn't know about the rule of 72. The other reason we pay out 72% is because every number has significance. And I want to talk significance. I want to talk to you about two numbers. One is the number of unity, two is the number of separation, three is the number of God, four is the number of the earth, five is the number of grace, six is the number of man. <sighs> Seven is the number. Seven is the number of completion. There's seven. There are seven colors in the rainbow. There's seven notes on the musical scale. Okay. Seven is the number of completion. Eight is the number of new beginnings. Yes, it is. But eight is also the number of abundance. In fact, in abundance. In fact, if you turn an eight on its side, it is the symbol for infinity. And by the way, when time ends, what is the new beginning? The new beginning is eternity. Okay? Nine is the number for truth. You say, Myron, what do you mean nine is the number for truth? Well, 
So the Hebrew word, I'm going to go ahead and give this to you. I'm almost done, so hang in there with me. The Hebrew word for truth is the word amet. And the word amet is aleph, which is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And um, and I'm not, I know I'm not doing a good job with that. Mem, and then, and then tav. So aleph, mem, tav. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. That's the middle letter, and this is the last letter. So the thing that we understand about truth is that in order for you to understand the truth about anything, you've got to know the beginning, the middle, and the end. If you don't know the beginning, the middle, and the end, you don't know the truth. The second thing is each one of these letters in Hebrew has a number. The number for the letter Tav is 400, the number for the letter M is uh, 40, and the number for the letter Aleph is 1, so it's 441. So if you take 441 and you put those numbers together, 4 plus 4 is 8, plus 1 is 9, 9 is the number for truth. I know that I went through that kind of fast. The reason 9 is the number for truth is because the truth can never be completely hidden, and 9 can never be hidden. If you multiply 9 times any number, whenever you get the answer, the answer is always going to come back to 9. 9 times 1 is 9. 9 times 2, 9 times 2 is what? 18. And then 8 plus 1 is what? 9. Uh, 9 times 3 equals 27. 2 plus 7 equals 9. By the way, it doesn't matter how many times. I can multiply 9 times a 75-digit number. If I keep adding all the digits in the number together until it comes to a single-digit number, that single-digit number will always be 9. So 9 is the number for truth. How many of y'all picking up what I'm putting down? Give me some... Okay, I know I said that kind of fast. Nine's the number for truth. So, what we decided to do, since the Virtual Millionaire Club was created, was created to teach you the truth about wealth, was created to teach you the truth about wealth, this is the number for abundance or wealth, is the number eight. Nine's the number for truth. Nine times eight is 72. We pay out 72%. The membership is $27.99. Why? Because 2 plus 7 is 9, plus 9, plus 9 is uh, plus 9, rather, not times. Plus 9 is 27, and 2 plus 7 is 9. That's why 72%, that's why $27.99, that's why the m marketing... Um, master's course is $99.99. There are other things that the Virtual Millionaire Club does. Here's what you should do. You should click the link above this video. If you want to know more about the Virtual Millionaire Club, click the link above this video. Go watch the presentation about the Virtual Millionaire Club. Go see what all the members are saying. Don't take my word for it. Go see what all the members are saying about the content. Click the like link above this video. Now, if you came to this video from my page, from Myron Golden's page or because you got an email from me, send me a me if you message me on Facebook, I'll send you a link because there's no link above this video. Why? Because I want you to think about this. I created the Virtual Millionaire Club. I created the content. I created the platform. I'm doing the presentation right now. And I'm telling the people who are on this uh, Facebook Live to click the link above this video. Why? Because this is how we've, this is a system we've developed to help our members promote the Virtual Millionaire Club. They share it on their Facebook wall. They put their affiliate link above the video. When you come to that, when one of your friends invited you to come watch this, or you saw it on their page, their link is above this video. You click their link, and they're getting paid for the work I just did. Talk about partnerships. I've never seen a partnership this good. And I am looking forward to partnering with you